Hello, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you very much for supporting this really worthy cause, and thank you very much for inviting me to say some words. Uh, those who don't know me, my name is Gavin Sharples. I'm a professional speaker. I've been on the professional speaking circuit about 25 years now, dealing with local and international companies. I hope you guys are, are keeping well, keeping strong. Also, uh, when I decided to put this video together, and uh, I then looked at the background, and I thought, hell, background's a little bit funny, a little bit weird, but the background is actually going to make perfect sense. I'm going to do something with the background a little bit later. All right. Many years ago, I was uh, having lunch with a friend of mine who I call the inventor of Scrabble. He uses his big corporate words, you know those people? And over, over lunch, he turned around and said to me, no, Gavin, but you're an agitator. And I must admit, I wasn't offended. I actually thought to myself, I am an agitator. So it's almost been a, a theme of mine ever since I can remember, especially when I started speaking, to go and try and create a disturbance in the workplace, in the corporate world, from getting on stages without my pants on to walking through Santon Shopping Center in my pajamas to being one of the first people to ever do a full keynote presentation on an airliner. Uh, you know where the, the air desk grabs the thing and goes, uh, please fasten your seatbelts. I grabbed that and I, we did a talk down to Cape Town. First synthetic fuel flight by Cecil and I did a keynote all the way down and they liked it so much we did a keynote coming back. So I've always wanted to do things a little bit differently and that's what I've been speaking about. I speak to companies and people and marriages and relationships and say, if something's not working, what are you doing about it? Because if you're not doing anything about it, nothing's ever going to change. But the funny thing is you get hit by these blank stares and people look at you and they go, yeah, yeah, but they don't change. They don't innovate. They don't do things differently. Let me tell you a story. So have you ever heard of a flea circus? A, a, literally a flea circus. Afrikaans means a flea circus. So what they do is they actually get fleas and they train fleas to do tricks. Now, can you imagine how difficult this is? Can you imagine the size of a flea's brain? I mean, they must be flipping tiny. But they can actually train them to do tricks. And it's very, very simple. What they do is they put them, they start off, they put them in a fish tank, okay? Which is their glass box, okay? And it must be glass. And then what they do is they, fleas have a natural instinct to jump, okay? They jump. So what they do is they, 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 they want to try and stop them jumping out. So they put a piece of glass over the top of the, of the fish tank. Now the flea still looks up, doesn't know what a glass roof is or stuff, but the flea looks up, its instinct says I can get out and they jump and they hit their heads. And now even a flea brain, after trying four, five, 10, 30 times, even a flea brain turns around and goes, you know what, eh? I don't think this is working and I'm getting a headache. So what it does is it modifies its jump. It goes from jumping, let's say the 30 centimeters, it now jumps 29 centimeters. And at 29 centimeters, guess what? There's no pain. So what it does is it modifies its behavior. So it starts jumping at 29, okay? Now what they do is they lower it a little bit more and they can actually then, they condition the flea to jump at a certain, so the flea jumps and it jumps. Now what they do is they put up this little hurdle and they take away the glass, but they've conditioned the flea. So what does the flea do now? The flea jumps like that. And it jumps over this, this hurdle. And everyone goes, wow, look, they've trained the flea. And they give the flea a certain color. Now, if they want to do a long jump flea, all they do is they take the glass and they put it a lot lower down. Now the flea jumps and it's got no room. So what it does, it starts jumping more forward than it starts jumping high. So you've got a long jump and a high jump. And then they do all sorts of things. They get them to pull things. They get them. Listen, you can train fleas and you can condition fleas to do all sorts of tricks. That's the message. Now, one day the one flea turns around and he looks up and he says, you know what, I'm out of here. I don't like doing these tricks anymore. I want to get out of here. And what does everybody say? All the other fleas turn around and say, no, 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 you can't. You're going to bump your head. Get it? You're going to bump your head. And he says, you know what, I'm going to go for 29 centimeters. He goes 29 centimeters, no pain. He thinks I'm going to go 30 centimeters, no pain. Because remember, they've taken the glass away now. So now this guy's very confident. Now he's jumping 35, he's jumping 40. He says to everybody, look at me. And everybody goes, no, you're going to bump your head. Stay inside the box. You're going to bump your head. One day, our intrepid flea, uh, our little motivated flea champion turns around and goes, you know what? You see that dog over there? I'm out of here, bud. I need to, I need to get out of here. They say, oh, no, no. What happens if you miss? You're going to die. And guess what he does? He jumps. And he jumps perfectly and he lands on the dog. And he is, he's arrived. He says to his friends, 
you got to come. Come on. It's wonderful here. you got to come. you got to get outside the box. you got to start. You can think outside the box. you got to get outside the box. And they go, no, no, don't disturb us. You were lucky. Sounds familiar? That's exactly what happens to people. So for 25 years, I've been going to companies and telling them, please do something different. You've got to change. You've got to innovate. You have to do something different. And I get called an agitator. And people say, who oh, no. We just don't want to disturb it and be careful don't say this and mustn't do this and you get a whole list of all the things you can and can't say within companies and corporates and you've got to be politically correct and all that stuff basically what happens to people exactly like those fleas eventually they get told no mustn't can't stop and eventually they get boxed in yes and we are stuck in our boxes now here is the bad news the bad news is that the invitation to jump the invitation has now been removed because you're no longer invited to jump. You actually now have to jump. Why? Because somebody has set the box on fire. Your worst case scenario has actually come true. This whole COVID thing has now definitely said to you, you have to start making massive amounts of changes in your business, in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship. So we no longer have a choice. Now you have to jump. Ladies and gentlemen, it's officially jump time. There are three basic groups of people in the jumping world. First of all, there are the jumpers. These are the people who love jumping. These are the ba they, they're basically born to jump. They're born jumpers. They jump and they entrepreneur entrepreneurial and they, they like different they like doing different things. So a lot of people start companies up, they start ups. They start it up, once it gets running, they try something new, they try something different. These are the people who love adventure. These are the people, as soon as this whole COVID thing happened, even in the lockdown, they were saying, thank goodness, because now I can change pace and I can focus on these two or three other projects that I'm working on. These people, they are right now, these are the people who are thriving. These are the people who are out sourcing masks from all over the world and making profits on it even before the lockdown began. You know those people? Now you get those people out there. These people, I'm not even talking to those people because they're already out there, they're already jumping. The next group are what we call the, the, the people who achieve a jump status. These are the people who need motivating, they need coaxing, they need somebody to show them the due diligence of the whole operation. They need to be coaxed and, and, and warmed, they need to have samples, and they need to have a, a, a let me try it for a couple of months, but eventually they're probably going to jump because they know that it's imperative and they need to. The third group of people are the people who say don't disturb. The third group of people are the ones who don't want to jump. These are the people who have to have jump thrust upon them. And make no mistake, the jump has been thrust upon them by COVID in one way or another. So the message is really simple. You have to jump. Now, when you jump, how do we make sure that we are able to live outside of the box? Three things I want to share with you today. Number one, you've got to change, innovate, and do things differently. I call it chinking. Change, innovation, and creativity. That's K for creativity because we're creative people. We must make sure that we start changing, innovating, and doing things different. Now, let me unpack change, innovation, and creativity. Number one, change says, I have an alternative. I can go from this to this. So in other words, everybody before this thing was using cash. All of a sudden, there's a big change now. What are they doing? They're now using EFTs and they're using SnapScan. So there's a whole different way of payment. You see that there was another way of payment. So all we have to do is go from whatever we were doing there, we change it to do something else, okay? Um, meetings. Everybody was having meetings. I think the one good thing to come out of this thing is that there's going to be no more meetings. One meeting in an office would take me about three hours, an hour or so to get there, an hour for the meeting and another hour to get home. That's three hours for one meeting and they could have said it on the phone. Now all of a sudden there's an alternative. It's called Zoom. We've changed from this to that. Okay, so change is pretty simple. If there's an alternative and it's there, it's set up, change is there. Okay, the next is innovation. Innovation says we don't have something we can just swap to. What we do have is our products, our services. What can we do to tweak them, to innovate them, to make sure that they are relevant? A uh, great example again, restaurants. So a lot of restaurants only had sit down things. So they've got the food, they've got the kitchen, they've got the know-how and they've got the staff. So what do they do? They have to innovate. We're gonna do deliveries, we're gonna do takeaways. And we basically are still running our business, but there's an innovation that's taken place, okay? And the third one is creativity. Creativity means we were running a business, we were doing whatever we were doing, and it's no more. 
and there is no alternative. Now we have to create opportunities. Now we have to create markets. Now we have to start creating products and services. We've got the know-how, we've got the skills behind us, but we have to start from scratch and we have to create something new, a new offering. Some people might even change their careers now. So, so creating something brand new from nothing, change, innovation and creativity. Those things are now absolutely necessary and imperative. You have to start doing things differently. In your marriage, in your relationship, if something is not working, you have to start doing something different. So let me talk about change for a bit. A lot of people are scared of change. People think uh, that change is bad. You know, in certain circumstances, change can be bad, but generally change is actually good. But a lot of people complain and say, you know, that there's so much destruction that happens with change. And that's our problem is the destruction. And I say, but you know, destruction happens every single day. It happens every year we have destruction. It's called the weather. Have you noticed that? That you have summer, everything's growing, everything's going well, and all of a sudden you have the autumn. And in the autumn, things start slowing down and things literally start dying. And then what happens? You have the winter where everything's dead and it's cold, but we cope. And because it happens slowly, and then we think to ourselves, we can't do it anymore, and then there's spring, and then there's summer again. That is death, that is change. It happens all the time. It doesn't really affect us much because all we do is we put a jacket on or put the air conditioner on. But make no mistake, things live and they die. You have the changes that are happening all the time, but we get so used to them, don't we? So. There is destruction and destruction is around us, but people are saying, but you can't compare the weather and this destruction to the COVID stuff and the business stuff. Well, no, you can't, but let me then take you to a time when we had as much destruction and probably more destruction. It was called the Second World War. Now, in the Second World War, people were literally dying in their tens, if not hundreds of thousands. By the end of the war, millions and millions of people had perished. It was five years of absolute literal hell on earth. It was, it was COVID on steroids. Here's the thing that people don't really realize. The technological advancements that took place in those four to five years are like unprecedented. It's funny how people get into this, this comfort zone, this, this box of comfort, but all of a sudden, when they are forced to do something, when they are forced to change and innovate, when they are forced to find something new, they do. A couple of examples. Let's just look at the aircraft. Now, in 1940, the best aircraft they had were the, the, the ones with the propellers, the Hurricane, okay? So the Hurricane was the one and the Spitfire. These are the planes that they had in the 40s, in the early 40s. But from 1940, they realized that air superiority was a key. So what did they do? They changed, they innovate. Within four to five years, they were strapping jet engines onto planes. And that Messerschmitt, uh, whatever it is, 626, whatever it is, that Messerschmitt was available by the time the war ended, just before the war ended. Air travel changed in the Second World War. We went from propellers to jet engines, and then they kept it going. And that was out of necessity, change, innovation, creativity, and something positive came out of that carnage. You see how that works? The next thing to talk about is satellite. I'm speaking to you now probably because a satellite was involved. The reason why the Allies won the Second World War is because they had a little ace up their sleeve. The ace up their sleeve was a thing called radar. Every time the Germans tried to attack England, they were met on their way in as almost like they were expected and the Germans were wondering how this has happened. It's the thing called radar. The British set up radar sites all along their coasts and they were able to tell when the Germans were coming, okay? Now, radar obviously is the precursor to satellite, but here's something that very few people know. There was a guy when they were testing one of the radar devices and he was standing near one of the batteries that powered the radar. And all of a sudden he felt there was something wet in his pocket. He put his hand in his pocket and he pulled out and he had chocolate, melted chocolate in his pocket. And he thought, how on earth? And then he stood closer to the battery and there was no heat, but there was a, it melted the chocolate. So he started, investigating it. And you know what he found? He found things called microwaves. Do you know one of the reasons you have a microwave oven in your kitchen today? Second World War. Next thing, turn things upside down. Turn it on its head. Some things only work when you turn them on their heads. For example, a salt cellar, it only works when you turn it upside down. A bottle only works when you turn it upside down. So let me give you some practical ideas now for this COVID thing if you have any type of business. What we need to do is turn the whole sales cycle on its head. What we've got to do is go and speak to our clients and say to them, what is it that you need? 
Instead of saying to them, what can we sell you? Look at them and say, how can we help you keep your business? What help do you need from us so that we can sustain and go through this period? You need to sit down now with your propeller heads and your accountants and your, those bean counters and, and all the other shareholders and say to them, how can we run our business on lean and mean? In other words, how can we run it at, I don't know, cost plus 5%? In other words, for the next year or two, we won't make any profit. And all the profit we would have made, we actually pass that on to our customers. We're going to sit down now with our sales reps. You see, a lot of people say, we must start retrenching. I'm saying no. The people on the coal face are the people that are going to help you through this because the people on the coal face have the ideas. So we have to sit down with these people and we've got to have a creative congress. Not a meeting, have a creative conference where everybody sits around in bean bags and you just shout out ideas. I think we should do this, I think we should do that. Then you write all the ideas on pieces of paper and stick them all over the wall. And somebody says that and some ideas are funny and some aren't that funny, but you stick them all over the walls. When everybody runs out of ideas, now what you do is you take a little bit of that idea and a touch of that idea and a big smidgen of that idea and you create something that's unique for you, your company and your organization. Now is the time for people to pull together and start using their resources. Start looking for the innovative, the change people. You know that, that the loud mouth who had these wacky ideas? These are the people we need to talk to now. We really have to. We have to start turning the whole business model on its head. In some cases, it's the only way we're going to survive. Okay, We have to start doing things differently. I know in my industry, my industry, the... Um, the conferencing industry is closed. I mean, when are you going to put 50, 60 people in a room together? But that's the thing. You don't have to put 50, 60, 100 people in a conference. For the last 25 years, I've been doing the weirdest stuff, trying to get people to learn by experiencing stuff. Quick example. Um, they're going to run a change conference in Drakensberg. Long story, they called me in. Would I come and talk about change? And I said, you know what? If it's a change conference, shouldn't the conference be different? So let's say everybody gets told to go in their cars and meet at the Drakensberg Sun. But about 5Ks from Drakensberg Sun, everybody gets pulled off and said, there was a, a flood and the river is flooded and you have to walk. Okay, <laughs> that's the secret. If you packed it, you have to carry it. Now, people then pick up their own bags and they walk through the bush. They walk for about one kilometer, single file, keeping their social distancing. And then they, sit, they, they come to this clearing with these, these big wooden things that they can sit on. And they all sit around, they get given cold drinks and stuff. And the CEO stands up and he pulls out a flip chart and cookies from behind one of the trees. And he does a keynote presentation on what's happening in the business. He does it in 15 minutes or less and it must be fun. No, uh, pie charts or bar graphs. Don't you love people who put up spreadsheets at conferences and the first words out of their mouth, I know you can't see it clearly. I say, well, why put it up there, poop -all? Now what we do is we get everybody up and they walk further and they stop again and then the financial guy does his presentation and they walk a bit further. It takes them the whole day. All they do is they're out in the open going from lesson to lesson to lesson. By the time they get to where the Drakensberg sun is, we now serve them, listen to this, we serve them dinner at eight o'clock at night. You tell them to put their pajamas on and come down for breakfast okay we swap it around we give them breakfast instead of dinner the next morning we give them dinner instead of breakfast we then make them walk up the side of the mountain the drakensberg is some of the most beautiful scenery in the world but what do we do we put people in rooms with curtains facing forward with their cell phones off and we get them to watch the front people say how was the drakensberg i don't know i was in a room we drank we puked we got home we get them to walk up the mountain, get them to social distancing. And on the top of the mountain, I was there. I am the guru on the mountain. And I did a presentation with the entire Drakensberg as the backdrop. People, it's so simple if you just apply your minds. Very important. I wanted to add this one in. And this is very, very important. You've got to have a plan B. I think one of the most common things I'd ask people, I'd say to them, if you were to lose your job and you weren't able to work for six months, that was the worst case scenario I could come up with. If you weren't able to earn anything for six months, would that affect your lifestyle? And would you still be able to pay your rent? And, and would you just be able to go on until you found something else? Nine times out of 10, nobody could do that. Well, worst case scenario has happened. Worst case scenario has happened and do you have a backup plan? Now, I don't want to be a doomer and gloomer, but what I am is I'm direct. And what I am is I try and tell the truth. I think things are going to get a lot worse before they get better for two reasons. So if everything was going to run correctly, they said by September, you're going to start seeing the major spike. 
Right now, we are in July, beginning of, and we are seeing unprecedented numbers. In fact, they're talking about hard lockdowns again. What I'm trying to say to you is, is that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Gee, I hope I'm wrong. I hope somebody can actually look at this video six months, a year from now and say, ah, you were wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But let's say, let's just say, I'm half right. I want to ask you a question. Have you made plans? What have you done? What happens if you go to work tomorrow? And I'm, I'm talking now to people who work in corporates. Because remember, corporates are only as good as all the small businesses and stuff and all the people in jobs who buy stuff and then they buy stuff and the big corporates. What happens when all of those people are out of jobs? What happens when demand is down? What happens to these companies now who look at you and say, we can no longer keep you? What happens to the small businesses? What happens to the medium business? What happens to your relationships? All I'm saying to you now, no matter where you are, start making a plan B. That's my thing. That's all I wanted to say to you today. Number one, the box is on fire and you've got to jump. When you jump, you've got to hit the ground and you've got to change, you've got to innovate, and you've got to do different things. You've got to do different actions. Turn things on their heads. You've got to make sure that you have a plan of action for yourself, for your business, for your marriage. And what I want to do is I, I want to give away one of those books. In fact, the books you see behind, I said earlier on there was going to be a reason for it. So this is the brand new one. This one is called The Manual. It's uh, How to Be a Real Man. And uh, it's a big story about that. And this one here is called Shift Happens. So what I want to do is I'd like to give away one each of those books, if I can. How do we give it away? So for the, for the Virgos and the people who have, who have really been concentrating, you will probably have noticed that there's something wrong with the one book. And every time I've moved to the side behind me, there's something wrong with the shift book. So these, these books are called Shift Happens, okay? Which is about change and innovation and doing things differently. It's a Q and A type of book. So yes, Shift Happens, there's been a problem with the books at the back. If you can actually go to Gavin Sharples Direct on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, if you can go there and you can tell me while I was speaking behind my right shoulder, okay, it was left to you, there was something, something was off. If you can tell me what was off. So that's number one. Tell me what was off with the shift book. And number two, tell me what the shift book is about. Now, in order for you to find out what the shift book is about, you're going to have to go to gavinsharples.co.za, go to my website, www.gavinsharples.co.za, go to Gavin Sharples, and there's a breakdown of what this book is. Just give me two or three lines what the book is about and tell me what was wrong. The first, five, the, the first couple that you do will do a lucky draw from those ones and you can win that book. It's about 197 odd bucks for that. So I'm going to put this back the way it was. Um, and then of course the, 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 uh, the manual, the real manual, we need you to go to Gavin Sharples. We need you to look at the last four, five, six different posts. If you look at those different posts, you'll be able to tell exactly what this book is about. So tell me what was wrong with the books behind me, number one. And number two, tell me what the book was about, okay? And, uh, and then what we'll do is we can send you those books. Thank you very much for supporting this wonderful organization. Thank you much for listening to me. And I really, truly wish you guys all the best. I believe that things are going to get better. They'll get worse before they get better. But you know what? You know, maybe in two years' time, we're going to look back and say, they were the worst of times, but they were the best of times. It's amazing how strong we are and how we come together when there is a crisis like this. And I think that's the secret. The secret is the coming together and all standing together. Good luck, God bless, and keep safe.